wrongfully executed. More than two decades after the US state of Texas killed this man, a study reveals he was innocent. We take a closer look at the case of Carlos de Luna and what it says about capital punishment in the United States. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Brutansi. In 1989, Carlos de Luna was put to death for stabbing and killing a petrol station cashier. Now, a Columbia University law professor, James Liebman, and his students say they've proven his innocence. They say his conviction was the result of a poor police investigation, unreliable eyewitness testimony, and a weak defense. Their report concluded that the murderer was Carlos Hernandez, a man who bore a striking resemblance to him. Support for capital punishment in the United States has been on the decline over the last two decades. Nonetheless, despite the work of many groups that have raised questions about the fairness of the American justice system, around 60% are still in favor of the death penalty. Today, there are more than 3,200 on death row. This year, 18 people have been executed so far. But the number of death sentences is dropping every year, and more than a dozen states have now abolished capital punishment. Over the last 40 years, more than 130 have been released from death row. Nate Fields is among those exonerated inmates. In 2009, he was acquitted of a double homicide after spending almost 20 years in prison, including more than 11 years on death row. I asked him what he felt after reading about Columbia University's investigation into the DeLuna case. When I read about it, I was pretty much horrified. And in the back of my mind, I'm saying I'm so sad because, you know, I, I knew something like this was going to happen. And I feel like it didn't happen numerous times before, but I was just so sad to see that it had finally happened, where it's factual that an innocent man was put to death for something he didn't do. And, of course, it could have been, it could have been you in that situation. Oh, no question. It truly could have been me. I mean, uh, Carlos De Luna... He had one eyewitness against him, and that's the same type of case that mine was. I had one eyewitness, you know, and uh, it seems like everybody went with that one eyewitness. And then, lo and behold, it came to the light that, hey, he wasn't the man, just like me. But truly, it, it didn't have to go that way. You know, I could be right in Juan Luna in Luna's position, you know, right now. Do you feel the same problems with the system that put you on death row are still in existence? Yes, they are. It is without any doubt. And I'll tell you why. The, the main reason why the death penalty should be abolished is because the human factor. And that factor is going to continue to play out as long as we have the death penalty. Because we all, as being human, we're going to make mistakes. And mistakes are going to be made. That 12 juries, just because it's 12 people, doesn't mean that 12 people can't get it wrong. They can. And they can because the human factor. You know, we see it all the time in a baseball game. The guy slides in the second base. But on further review, he was out. That man can go back to the dugout. But with the death penalty, you can't bring a man back from the graveyard. Tell us what death row was like. Pretty much death row was, it was a living hell. It was a living hell. You in a cell that's like five by eight. You can only walk like maybe three feet in the entire cell. When you brought out the cell, you led around in leg shackles, hand chains. Uh, guards lead you around with a chain as if you're a dog. Every time you come out the cell, you're allowed out the cell only one hour a day. I saw prisoners go insane, lose their mind. Men that when I first came to death row told me the ropes before I left, half of them was executed and the remaining had, had pretty much lost their mind. What would you say to those who say, we understand the problems with the system, we understand that there's a risk of killing an innocent person, but that's the price we have to pay. For some crimes, death is the only answer. Well, I would, I would completely disagree with that analysis. I would completely disagree because one execution of a wrongfully a convicted person is one too many. 
So what are the flaws in America's implementation of capital punishment? Joining us from New York is Sean Crowley, one of the authors of Los Tocayos Carlos, the report that seeks to establish that Carlos de Luna was innocent. Here in the studio is Bruce Fine, former U.S. Associate Deputy Attorney General and a constitutional lawyer, and Richard Dieter, Executive Director at the Death Penalty Information Center. Sean Crowley, then. How did you reach the conclusion that Texas had killed an innocent man when they executed Carlos de Luna? Well, our report um, actually just seeks to lay out all the facts and let the readers make that conclusion. We, as the authors, ourselves did come to that conclusion, and I speak for myself when I say I do believe that that's what happened. But when we set out to do this project, we set out to expose as many of the facts as we possibly could and allow the readers to come to the conclusion as to whether or not they believe that Texas wrongfully executed an innocent man. All right, so let's run through some of the specific findings of your investigations. Um, I suppose beginning with the, the issue of DNA. Right. There was no, actually no DNA that was ever uh, found or used in this case. When Professor Liebman and his team went to Corpus Christi in 2003, they tried to get the physical evidence from the case so that they could run a DNA analysis, but that physical evidence had been checked out of the prosecutor's office and um, lost. So there was never a DNA analysis that was, that was done on this case. Uh, what about knowledge of the potential for another suspect? Well, that's one of the, the big points in the report that we, that we brought to light, is that there was very likely another man who committed this murder by the name of Carlos Hernandez. And uh, it took Professor Lehman and his two law students one day in Corpus Christi to find out about Carlos Hernandez. And once he did, he, he talked to numerous people in the community who knew uh, both Carlos de Luna and Carlos Hernandez, and um, they, they all spoke about Carlos Hernandez and his violent history and his love for the switchblade knife that was found at the scene of this murder. Um, he was known to the prosecutors who prosecuted Carlos de Luna and he was known to the investigators and the police officers who were conducting the investigation at the time. As well. and, and, and in fact some said that he had actually had boasted about this killing. Right, there are several people um, who, who told Professor Lehman and his team that, that he had boasted about this, including people he lived with and people he was close to. Uh, uh, he said, I, I murdered this woman, Wanda Lopez, and my stupid Tokayo, Carlos, is, getting, is going to prison for it. Tokayo meaning? Meaning namesake. Uh, what about the way then that the prosecution and the police then handled this, um, both during the investigation and during the trial? Well, again, one of the, the points that we bring out is that Carlos Hernandez's name was known very well to everyone in the community, including the investigators, including the um, prosecutors, and yet they didn't find him. And, and Carlos de Luna actually fingered him right before trial, and at trial, the main prosecutor on the case kind of made a mockery of, of that and said, this man is a phantom, he doesn't exist, when in fact we found Carlos Hernandez's rap sheet in the prosecutor's file. And one of the prosecutors on the case had actually uh, been involved in another murder case in which Carlos Hernandez was a suspect and certainly knew about his existence. Was De Luna given adequate representation and was actually that uh, representation given uh, enough, all, all of the evidence on hand that they needed in order to defend De Luna? Well, we also uh, highlight in the report that when Carlos de Luna gave the name Carlos Hernandez to his lawyers uh, before trial, instead of going out and trying to find this Carlos Hernandez, which we think would have been a fairly simple thing to do, they just gave his name over to the prosecutors who also didn't go and really try to look for him. So, uh, I mean, that would be one thing that, that probably should have happened that didn't. And what was de Luna's lawyer like? What, did he have experience? He didn't have experience at all. He was actually a very new lawyer. He was appointed by the judge to take Carlos de Luna's case. And there is that issue also of witness testimony, which is so key in, in this. Uh, it, was it credible? Well, the, there was one eyewitness to the murder, um, and he identified Carlos de Luna um, in what's called a show-up, where uh, 
About an hour after the crime was committed, the police brought Carlos de Luna back to the scene. It was nighttime. They shone a, f a flashlight into the back of the police car, and they said, "Was this, this is the guy we got. Was this the man you saw? And he identified him and said, yes, this is the man we saw. Um, we, we, we believe, and, and many people in the community also believe, that Carlos Hernandez and Carlos de Luna looked quite a bit alike, especially from that angle, especially at night, and especially in a police car when the police said, we think we've got the man who, who d maybe did this. Um, and p show ups are widely regarded as not very reliable. All right, so Richard Dieter then. Well. Um, so many questions to be asked about this case, and yet Carlos de Luna was uh, executed. And yet, when we hear proponents of the death penalty, for example, actually the Texas governor, Governor Rick Perry, uh, who um, was recently speaking on this, this is the sort of thing that actually they, that they usually say. We have a bit of Governor Rick Perry right now. Your state has executed 234 death row inmates, more than any other governor in modern times. Have you... Have you struggled to sleep at night um, uh, uh, with the idea that any one of those might have been uh, innocent? No, sir, I've never struggled with that at all. The state of Texas has a uh, very thoughtful, a very clear process in place of which when someone commits the most heinous of crimes against our citizens, they get a fair hearing, they go through an appellate process, they go up to the Supreme Court of the United States if that's required. But in the state of Texas, if you come into our state and you kill one of our children, you kill a police officer, you are involved with another crime and you kill one of our citizens, you will face the ultimate justice in the state of Texas, and that is you will be executed. What do you make of... Uh... Richard Dieter, I mean, given what, what the Columbia team ha has unearthed, do you think that Rick Perry needs to change his opinion? Even perhaps Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court in the past has said, look, there's not been one case, as far as he's aware, of, of, of the wrong person being executed. Yes, I, I think it's very important that we depoliticize this whole death penalty. It's being used as, as a, a tool to get votes or to make uh, sound bites. But, you know, when you look at the facts, when you look at these cases that are clearly uh, injustices, uh, this Carlos de Luna case is a textbook for all the things that can go wrong with the death penalty. And this is, this is in Texas, and this is not the only such case. You have to say, we need to look at this as a system and, and, and stop sloganizing about it and, and, and take a look. Uh, the American public is, is actually starting to do that. You know, they're voting in the jury booths, and they're, they're voting in legislatures, and we're seeing a lot, a lot less use of the death penalty. Bruce, fine. I mean, would you, I mean, you are a proponent of the death penalty, but would you accept that the de Luna case it's perhaps just the latest example where serious questions have to be made about the way in which the death penalty is implemented at the very least and the, and the, the, the processes that lead to people being executed. Yes, I think that the death penalty as currently administered is greatly flawed. And I think the debate needs to be about what the death penalty and the procedure for implementation say about us. It's not about the bad guys. It's what they say about us as a governing people. And if I was to rewrite the laws, I would add many procedural safeguards against the possibility of making error, like requiring DNA, changing the standard of proof from beyond a reasonable doubt to beyond any doubt whatsoever, uh, and requiring that the defense counsel be properly compensated and have that expert knowledge that enables them to find flaws in the prosecution's case. So, so that would suggest then that most of the, the reasons why Carlos de Luna was executed have not been solved. Sean, Sean Crowley, how, are, these, are these issues still um, or are these problems still in existence? Do we have safeguards from handling evidence to the experience of the law or even assigned to a death penalty case? Have any of these things actually been fixed? Well, we don't believe so. I mean, I think that that's a good point because this is kind of, this isn't a recent case. Carlos de Luna was executed in 1989 and we're just publishing this report now because we think that many of these same problems and these same errors that you highlight still exist and are still still at play in a lot of the cases that are pending today. Uh, is it simply a matter though, of, of these procedural issues, uh, Richard Dieter, though? I mean, actually, Professor Liebman, who, who led this team, 
once wrote that actually there's a systemic question too. Prosecutors, police, judges are rewarded for imposing death sentences, but th that does not force them to avoid making mistakes and bearing the cost of making mistakes. Is there a systemic issue here as well? Yes, I, I think the death penalty is sort of an all-in. You know, if you're going for the death penalty, your reputation is on the line and, and winning. Most of our criminal justice system is based on uh, plea bargains and, and compromises and, uh, you know, doing uh, the best we can. But the death penalty, of course, is, you know, once it's carried out, can't be taken back. We have no, no, no room for error. And so it is a systemic problem as, as well as the, uh, you know, the, the procedural problems that Mr. Fine and Ms. Crowley have mentioned. Those are, those are improvements, but you've got a bigger problem, I think. Uh, and Bruce, I mean, is there that sense that you have to, when you look at some of these details, wonder about the motivation of the prosecutors or the police in these sorts of cases? Is it simply justice or, or is there something else at play here? No, I think there is something else at play. The United States Supreme Court in the famous case uh, called Berger said that the government wins when justice is done, not whether it wins and loses. But that is, I think, deaf to the ears of most prosecutors. But what Richard has identified is a systemic problem that's not limited to death penalty cases. It's there in any kind of case where you have a high-profile uh, defendant. And I don't think that you can get rid of that. The problem that I see in the death penalty case is that the defense counsel is very weak, inept, inexperienced. They're very underpaid. They don't have the same resources to get uh, investigators to gather exculpatory evidence. And that's why I would raise the procedural barriers to implementing the death penalty. But what, when you think about a case where Saddam Hussein was sentenced to death, is that people worried about, well, I wonder whether he really did anything wrong? There are these unique cases that I do think, I think that's symbolic. Were, actually. Justice had to be seen to be done, and, and perhaps <laughs> some would argue that perhaps wasn't. I mean, yeah, uh, well, because uh, we are the civilized ones, after all, I thought. Right? Uh, <laughs> that, but in civilized, in civilized law, we need to recognize that inflicting death is occasionally permitted. For example, self-defense. If someone's trying to take your life or even the life of someone else, you're entitled to kill them because of the danger, the, the heinousness of the action. And in wartime, you know, deaths are, are, are legal. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the Battle of the Bulge. And that doesn't mean it decides the death penalty cases, but the law does recognize special circumstances where you can knowingly right. take the life of someone. Just, just I mean, before we move on a bit then, I mean, what, I mean, review is clearly very important, Richard Dieter. What is, what is the procedure then if new evidence comes to light after a conviction? Because clearly it was coming out all the time in this case. Is there an automatic procedure to ensure that that is then considered, especially if someone is on, on death row? Do, do people have a constitutional right to have this, ha have any changes in evidence looked at? Is there a constitutional right for DNA testing, for example, as technology improves? Well, th that has changed a bit. It didn't used to be a right to constitutional uh, DNA testing, but, but that is now the law in almost every state. Uh, so things are changing, but really the appeals court, they look at problems with the trial, not evidence, not what the jury decided, but whether uh, a fair process, whether uh, proper witnesses were allowed and evidence was allowed at the trial. New evidence is, is a difficult area because they don't want to retry the case. They've already got a verdict. But do prosecutors in some way stand in the way? Well, actually, is that changing? Because now we have lots of prosecutors themselves leading review processes in some states. But I mean, is that, is that sure. changing? There are, there are good prosecutors and, and just like a defense lawyer is good and bad on, on both sides. And we, we depend on sort of an adversarial system. And that means that the prosecutors are going to fight to retain their conviction and their death sentence. And as I say, the death penalty is, is, is this all or nothing thing. And I think that's, you know, I think in a, in a normal case, you can say, well, perhaps mistakes were made, we should do this over. But the, the death penalty, everybody's but, watching it. But I think the Supreme Court has indicated, even if not in express terms, that a showing of actual innocence after the fact will prevent the implementation of the death penalty. They've used the word actual innocence. Now, what level of evidence that they're right. stating is required to meet that threshold is a little ambiguous. There is a problem in the review process when people are on death row. They eat whatever the Supreme Court may, might have said. There's also the arbitrary nature of the death penalty being handed down in the first place. There seem to be so many factors, or, you know, with how evidence was handled, how the trial was handled, what state you were in, what race you were in, and so forth. I mean, wouldn't that also then uh, suggest that there are problems with this entire system, Sean Crowley? Yeah, and I think that that's kind of another uh, thing that this report highlights is that this wasn't a case where, this isn't a case like Saddam Hussein or a case that everybody talked about or that anyone really talked about. It was a very 
um, case that just kind of went under the radar and it went, went very quickly. And there were lots of small errors made and lots of oversights, but there was not, you know, it wasn't one of the most egregious cases that you can find. And, and I think that that's kind of, that was one of the points in our writing of this report is just to show, listen, if this kind of error is happening in a case that no one really was watching and no one not really cared about, then, then these kind of errors could be, you know, rampant in, in all kinds of cases. Richard Dieter, there's also the issue of why the death penalty is thought to be um, is thought to be the solution at the end of at the end of a criminal process. We want to leave out. I mean, the, the whole moral issue we, 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 we'll we'll leave for another time. But but recently, the National Research Council in the U.S. did some some research on the deterrence effect. I mean, does it deter others from committing crime? What what have, what have they discovered? Well, I mean, as Mr. Fine said, it, it's certainly in a society, some killing is allowed. The question is, is the death penalty necessary? Is it serving a, a goal? Do we make society safer? And one of the arguments was, well, it, it deters other people from committing the crime. And this has been studied over 30 years since the death penalty came back. And the, the most prestigious scientific research organization, the National uh, Research Council, just concluded that the studies claiming a deterrent effect were fatally flawed and should not be relied on. So I think that we, we can put this deterrence argument to rest. It, it's just not there. Right, There's so, no proof. So Bruce Wayne, we have all these problems and we have the risk of, put, of killing an innocent person. We have the arbitrariness of the actual, um, of the sentencing process. We have the cost financially because actually these are long review processes and actually often there are reversals and so forth. There's the effectiveness as far as deterring crime is concerned. I mean, when you put all those together, can you really see a, an argument then for the death penalty as you, as, as you do? The limited case. I mean, the, the, what about what you would do if, if Adolf Hitler survived or if Hermann Goering didn't about, take the... Let's talk about the, Carlos de Luna and, and the example no, of... You know, no, but, but I think that you're trying to then blur the issue of taking one case where it was improperly applied, and I agree with that analysis, and saying, therefore, you never have the death penalty in any circumstance whatsoever, because I will so agree. Great? But I'm saying you can make the risk minimal by requiring DNA evidence, by establishing proof beyond any doubt whatsoever. And I say, I don't think people would, would question whether Adolf Hitler or Hermann Goering were responsible for heinous atrocities against Jews at Auschwitz and otherwise. And the reason for retaining the death penalty is not because it deters. I don't think dictators are deterred because Saddam Hussein got the death sentence or that you prevented genocides because at Nuremberg people got the death sentence. It's because there's cert you want to reserve a certain category of savage contract, of savage conduct, that you're, spe yet you're signaling that this is below any level that civilization can Richard, tolerate. Richard Dieter, then, do you think the system is fixable or is it simply unworkable given all of these factors and the risk of killing an innocent person? Well, I, I think the improvements that Mr. Fine mentioned are worthy things that uh, should be implemented and tried. But I think we've been trying these things in piecemeal fashion for a lot of years and we, we simply haven't succeeded. And that's because, you know, humans can only be made so close to perfect and, and there's going to be a, a chance of error. And these reforms are very expensive and we could be using the money for more police on the streets or better lighting in crime areas and and and, and, and finally uh, you, you know if we only had the death penalty for the worst possible crime well that's sort of what we're supposed to have now and it just doesn't work and the reason is you can have the death penalty say for the murder of a police officer soon the legislature is going to want to pass a law for the murder of a firefighter murder of a teacher, murder of a child. And that's how we got to the point we are now where almost any murder is eligible for the death penalty. We've got thousands of people on death row, cases like Carlos de Luna, the, the system's overwhelmed and we make mistakes. Sean Crowley, what's your, what, is your, what are your thoughts on it? Is this a fixable system or, or is it just unworkable by definition? Well, I personally, I think that it's not a fixable solution and that it is unworkable. And I, I guess I just don't see the utility in keeping something around for the very extreme cases um, that, that may come when having it means that cases like this are going to happen. And what do you think the trend is then, Richard Dieter? I mean, there, there are clearly, it is 60% of the U.S. population, according to the polls, is in favor of the death penalty. Where is this going there? Is this discussion being had actively, do you think? You know, actually, in these polls, when people are given the alternative choice of life without parole as, as a sentence, the, the support drops to below uh, 50%. More people support life without parole. So the, the public supports the death penalty in theory, 
but when looking at it in practice, they're voting for it less and less. You have five states in, in the past five years have abolished it. You have a 70% drop in, in death sentences and a 50% drop in executions. I think we're coming to the conclusion that even if we imagine a, a perfect death penalty, the one we have isn't working and it's time to repeal it. I think the polls show that, in general, public support for the death penalty fluctuates depending upon their sense of the crime rate and danger. At one time in the early 1960s, I think a plurality was opposed to the death penalty, where crime rates were low. Then when it began to skyrocket, then support for the death penalty uh, skyrocketed as well. And I think it's because the public, on my judgment, wrongfully does think that the death penalty is the deterrent just like they think the TSA screening is a deterrent as well, even though it hasn't turned up anything. Uh, and that explains public opinion, which isn't always rational. Bruce Fine, thank you very much. Richard Dieter, thank you as well. Sean Crowley, thank you very much too. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program.